going to talk about afterloader system commissioning in QA. So our learning objectives, what do we want to get out of this hour? We want to talk about, okay, when you first get your afterloader commissioned, what delivered? What do you do for acceptance? Mechanically, for safety, for software and IT, and for interlock checks. We also want to understand what QA tests we need to do after there is a fault or a repair. Little checklist before you even get your afterloader. The first, first thing I do, I just got a brand new one last year. I went to the vendor website and they have all the manuals on there as PDFs. It's typically a user manual, which is a how-to for the equipment. There's a technical manual that's targeted as the engineers and physicists. And there's also a, an acceptance testing document that you will work through with your vendor when you get your device. There's also often sterilization instructions, cleaning instructions, and, and other things. I also usually go on various society websites to get resource documents, uh, recommendations, what the state of the art of practice is. That's the, for example, the IAEA, ESTRO, the AAPM has all their reports, task group reports for free to everyone. The American Brachytherapy Society has excellent guidance documents, so do the European organization. And of course, in whichever country you are residing, you will have local regulations about the use of radioactive byproduct material that you need to read through and familiarize yourself with. So let's go to delivery and install. First. This, what you see here, sadly, happened to our gamma knife. It was actually my interview day on UC Davis. I arrived there and everybody has a very sad face because the rigor dropped the gamma knife. So things happen in transport and especially now where we have supply chain challenges and packages are sitting in containers longer than usual. We need to inspect. First, we look at the outside of the package. Does this look okay? Or does it look squished up like this one here? So after we unpack, the, we do the wipe test, and not a wipe test for this case, it's not a source, the afterloader itself. We unpackage the cardboard box and all the wrapping, and then we look at, does the device have visible scratches or dents that it have gotten to the transport. And we also look at the cables and all ancillary equipment, if there's any fraying or pins are bent. We go through the shipping manifesto. Uh, does everything agrees, agree with the purchase order? Did you receive everything you paid for? Is everything accounted for in the proper place? Once you have everything installed, usually the vendor or third party does that, you want to go through acceptance testing, and that is usually done with the vendor there. So the machine is the property of the vendor when you get it, when it's delivered to your site. They will install it, and anything that breaks or is found defective during the install is still the responsibility of the vendor and is fixed at no cost to the customer. In the acceptance testing, the vendor and the site physicist, that is all of you together, sometimes with the vendor locked in remotely, you will go through the tests in this document. And what this is, is the vendor demonstrating to you that the machine is working as intended and as it's in the specifications when you get them, and it's performing to the accuracy that you requested. When you sign that acceptance testing document, at that point of time, the machine goes from the vendor property to being your property. And that is a very important step because everything that gets wrong goes wrong after that. You have to pay for either from your maintenance contract or however you have arranged for repairs and to be paid. So we are not going 
into very much detail about the acceptance testing documents because they are specific to each of the vendors and we, we don't have time to go through all of them. After you've accepted the machine, you will go to commissioning and that is you, the site physicist, getting the machine ready for your clinic. So, oh, this is a repeat of what, what I just said. So you have an agreement on the performance standard in your purchase contract. The vendor demonstrates that to you at the time of install. And then the machine goes into your property once you sign the acceptance testing. So I always, vendors often tend to give you the acceptance testing document at the time of install. I always like to request it four to six weeks early so I have enough time to read it, comprehend what's in there and ask questions. You also should have that extra time to compare the, sorry, I have some noise in the line. Excuse me, if you are not muted, can you please mute yourself? The, the contact information for your recommended uh, QA as well as data points of contact. I'm trying uh, so to if you use this. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Tomorrow, uh, um, we have the audience. I just had that's what I'm trying to do. I would go um, ahead. I'm, I will mute okay. this person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so, for you, so uh, you should uh, compare. Um, what is in your acceptance test specifications to anything that is outlined in your purchase contract and make sure that agrees. And if you find any discrepancy, bring that to the vendor attention as soon as possible. If there's anything unclear, ask question if, if there's anything. Then when you have read and understood this whole acceptance testing document, plan for how much time you need for acceptance testing. I typically schedule a half day to a day with the vendor to have everything smooth and figured out. And then after you sign the document, you keep a copy for your records. Okay. And okay, here's an example. Actually, from my <laughs> acceptance testing document recently, I did an upgrade that was a gamma mat in this case. And here is we have checked if the treatment planning system calculated the dose correctly at selected reference points. These were the coordinates. We crossed out the sources we did not use. We listed the sources we did use. Here is the pass fail criteria. It's plus minus 2%. I did my check mark. Customer demo required. That's for the vendor. Yes. And I said, okay, I have a brief report from Breaky Vision in this case attached, and this is my initials. On the right side, you see an example for a test that did not apply. We do not do brachytherapy 2D anymore in our center. So I have, instead of just leaving it empty, which is ambiguous, I have a note here that this is not applicable. That signals that yes, we've seen that there is a test there, but we have decided not to do that. And that is in agreement with everyone. So some examples what you will do. And again, it, this varies by vendor. The first is you confirm the functions. So the keys, very important, power out, outages happen. It's very important that the app works. The door interlock needs to work and other beam on indicators. You'll check out that the console display is working properly. And you also verify that if when you have a treatment interruption or after treatment that the data is retained properly. You also do checks on the source retraction that the source goes back into the afterloader correctly after treatment. That it also does it when you have to interrupt the treatment. The source is retracting when you have a loss of electrical or pneumatic power tube that the source doesn't go out or if there's a blockage. And also you verify and test that the emergency interrupt buttons all work. So after you finish the acceptance test, you go to commissioning. That's where the really, really fun physics work starts. So the very first thing we typically do is we do a radiation protection survey. That's, I think you all covered that in session two. 
the next thing I check in my center is the IT and system administration, because if I have connectivity issues that usually takes IT a little bit of time to resolve, and if they know that early in the process, that's really helpful. So then you check the treatment unit functionality, and then you set up your QA, the daily, the quarterly, and the annually, annual QA. So let's go to stage one, the survey you cover already, IT connectivity and system administration. Any connectivity and data transfer issues take time to resolve. There are firewalls involved and all kinds of things that IT needs to possibly fix. And I do these first because all of the following tests with the afterloader and setting up QA, I can do this while IT is working on the other issues. So that's efficiency here. So what I check is connectivity. If you have a CT simulator or a regular simulator, do the images transfer to the planning system electronically? Is the planning system sending data to the afterloader correctly? Does your plan come over correctly? If you have a planning system that is connected to an electronic medical record system, not all of them are, some of them, check if that is working and check that both the planning system and the afterloader connect to your printer and can print out. At this stage, I also set up a USB transfer of data between all of these devices in case the network goes down. We have seen this with denial of service attacks or ransomware attacks every couple of years, most recently last year happened in the United States. I'm sure it happens in other countries as well. There are malicious hackers that will take hospital IT systems down and you need to be able to treat without your network working. So there's always functionality in your treatment planning system to write your treatment plan to a file. You can copy that file to your USB. You can bring that to, to your HDR console and upload that. You also can often take e-data or simulator data, copy it on a USB hard drive and bring that into your treatment planning system manually. Have that set up and working. It has saved me multiple times in the clinic with a patient in the, on the table under anesthesia. Things go, network goes down. You need to have that ready. Make sure you have at least two, two software administrators who know how to use the software and, and are master users. I say two because if you only have one and that one person is out sick or otherwise not reachable, you need to have a backup to pull in. Think hard about user administration. Who do you assign which roles and which rights? Uh, a physician should have different rights than a medical physicist, than a therapist who's delivering the treatment. Third point, really important, verify that, have a backup of the system, of your database, verify that that is working and maintained and also check that regularly. We've had instances where natural catastrophes such as the wildfires in California have taken down radiation oncology clinics and only because those clinics had a backup of the database were they able to get all the patient information back online and send that to other clinics to continue treatment. Very, very important to have a backup. Also servers crash, all kinds of things happen. Okay, so usually I have one person from the IT department, if you have one, um, delete brachytherapy physicist and one other appropriate person, like another physicist, or you may have an expert user or physician who are system administrators. For the physicist, we should be able to add or delete patients, create standard plans, edit the dummy run settings, and what you exactly do varies with the vendor. So for example, you can have the option to check all the channels with the dummy at the start of treatment and then treat all channels. Or some machines have settings that check all channels with the dummy at the start of treatment and then run a dummy for each channel before the source is run. So you should be able to edit what you do. You should be able to measure and enter the source strength and you should also determine the source decay settings. Some systems allow you to 
choose if you decay your source once daily on the exact time, sometimes it's every hour, every 75 minutes. If there is a choice, you as a physicist need to have the rights to make that choice and edit that. Again, I can't stress this enough, backup to external drive each night. Computers do funny things, they crash. Backup, if you have the option at all, back up to an offsite location. In my career, I have seen broken water pipes, draining stuff on the backup disk. We have natural catastrophes, floods, earthquake, hurricanes, wars, unfortunately. Make sure you have a non-local backup that can be less frequent than each night, maybe every week or so, but it should be done weekly or monthly. So let's go to stage three, treatment unit functionality. So these are the typical components of the system tests. I mentioned that before, check that all the console functions work, switches, batteries, printers, indicator lights, light bulbs go out, check that they're all there. Programmed operation, everything that you wanted to do, it does do, and you should complete a so-called end-to-end test, a complete cycle of a simulated treatment. You simulate a phantom with whoever does that in your clinic, you transfer the plan, you contour with the physician, you plan whoever does that in your site, physicist, physician, therapist, or symmetrist. You send that plan to the treatment unit and you have the person who's delivering the treatment running the treatment. Run through that complete cycle because you will find out what's not working or you will also find out where people have a lack of understanding what their role is or if they still have some uh, things about the system that they quite don't understand at the beginning and need a little bit of extra help and training. The source position accuracy is obviously also very important. You need to have a system in place, and I'll show you a few to verify that the source goes to the accurate place where, when you send it out. And you also need to verify that the source and the dummy source go to the exact same spot, because if they don't, you may see on a video camera that your dummy is correct, but maybe your source isn't correct. There's usually a, a check cable operation that, that tests that all the channels are clear before you send the source out. You need to understand how that works. You can have, if you have a multiple channel radiograph, that is usually helpful to see if your system works correctly. And if the vendor gives you any kind of test jigs or you buy that or build those yourself, you need to confirm that the accuracy. You also need to look at temporal accuracy. If you send out the source for 60 seconds, is the source actually going out for 60 seconds? So you typically do that with a stopwatch or I often use my iPhone, my phone. They have very good timers in here that are accurate as well. You also need to verify the transit dose and the source velocity, because if, if the source goes out much slower than you expect, you will give up extra unnecessary transfer dose to the patient. Safety interlocks deal with patient, public, and staff safety. So check that if you open the door, the source retracts. Check that your area radiation monitor is working correctly, that you have your audio and visual system communicating correctly. I usually just put a radio or a phone in the room and see if I can interact with that. Uh, Sometimes I put a little moving something in the room. Have a portable survey meter, um, ideally two <laughs> as a backup because these also break, available on the console and check that the audible and visual errors and alarm condition indicators work. The safety equipment that you need to have at the console. First of all, emergency instructions need to be posted right next to the console very visible and not obstructed by anything else. And this is because you train for emergencies, but in a panic, people forget. It is, yeah, it's just human nature. Emergency equipment is, you need to have a forceps to get the applicators out of the patient if you need to. You need to have an emergency safe, a lead pig where you can 
dump a source into. And if you have to release sutures or anything, you need to have some surgical supplies handy. You should also have the operator manual nearby if you have a non-emergency question that pops up. And again, have a survey meter. Radiation safety was covered in a different session. So let's dive a little bit more detailed into the source position accuracy here. So there are several commercial tools available. And very honestly, if, if you are good with tools. Slice, I guess, all right. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so several commercial tools. You can also build them yourself if you're a little bit handy. This one has a gaff chromic film and embedded distance markers for reference. Highly accurate machining of plus minus one millimeter. And you auto your radiograph the source on the film from the most distal source on the very top of that film you see here to the back. And you can see how well the source positions align with these little metal embedded wires that image on there and the tolerance is plus minus one millimeters. Next slide, please. All right. Okay. <laughs> so you run that for at commissioning, you run that for every channel and transfer tube at commissioning. There's also tools available that have have multi-channels. There's also technologies where you just have a webcam mounted above a ruler and the position of the dummy source relative to the live source can be confirmed with that ruler. And if you connect, disconnect the transfer tube in that test, you can also check if your system detects that the channel is obstructed and will not deliver the treatment. Okay, next slide, please. So let's go to temporal and timer accuracy. Next slide, please. I should also mention that you will be provided with an Excel spreadsheet with little tools for all of these. Okay, next slide. Timer function. So you program a test run with a defined time. I typically use two minutes. One minute is also good. You deliver the treatment and you measure the treatment time independently either with a calibrated stopwatch or I often use my phone's timer function. The tolerance is plus minus five seconds. Given that the human reaction time is about 0.25 seconds, some are slower, <clears throat> some people are faster. You have, you actually really have to focus really hard on making this accurate. Okay, next slide, please. So, the timer accuracy also measures the transit dose and the source velocity. What you typically do is you measure, you do a timer linearity check. So you deliver different treatment times lasting from 0.1 second, which is typically the shortest time any uh, afterloader can deliver, to a fairly long time that you would maybe see in a cylinder treatment or even beyond that. And then you can look at the timer error and also at the uh, timer linearity, okay? And you should have discussed this in the last session as well. And again, we'll provide you with an Excel spreadsheet to do this. Next slide, please. So this is a question just to gauge. I'm going to run the poll here. Yeah. So the film from your source position measurement shows a discrepancy of more than two millimeter. What can be done? So A, a trained physicist should be able to adjust the source position so it's in the correct place, and then you revalidate. B, a trained physicist adjusts the source position, but a revalidation is not necessary. C, you will need to have a service engineer adjust the source, and a revalidation is not necessary. Or D, you can't fix it, you just need to live with it for this particular source. Okay. I think I see the poll too yeah. launched. I don't, I don't see it here. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to run the poll, but I don't think it's... Yeah, we're having... It's the Russians yeah. again. Oh, <laughs> what a day, <laughs> huh? Um, Apologies for any Russians on the yeah, call. <laughs> no, that's not the oh. intention. Yeah, it's, it's been one of those days. I, I apologize, yeah. people, but I, I don't think I see our poll tool here. And I promise you it will be yeah. better next time. I did all the test runs, but I guess I didn't anticipate yeah. this long enough. But you can also put your yeah. answers in the chat with us. And, yes, when we're doing it. 
Yeah. yeah. So I, I can, since we don't have the poll, I'll answer that. So it, it, it actually depends a little bit on your afterloader. In my specific afterloader, mm -hmm. I can adjust the source position within, I believe two millimeters. There's a tolerance. If it's out more than two millimeters, I have to call the service engineer, but I can tweak a little bit. The previous yeah. afterloader I had did yeah, not allow the physicist to adjust the source position. So I had to call the engineer and get the engineer to do that. After you adjust the source position, you always revalidate the film. Okay. Can everybody please mute themselves? Okay. Next slide, please. Please mute yourself. Don't forget to mute yourself. Next slide. Yeah. So again, most systems answer A is correct. Some systems you will have to get a service engineer, some older systems. Okay. So next slide. Okay. Please everybody mute yourself. A lot of background noise. To do this and mute people because I'm the host. Oh, cool. of it. Can you go to the next slide? So yes. Uh, yeah. Let's so you continue. I want to have enough. Yeah. Okay. I think one up. A uh, one up. Went two. Yeah. I think you went two. Oh, there. Back. Yeah. That yeah. one. Transfer tube and applicator commissioning. I just want to say that it's a very integral part of the treatment unit and you need to touch and commission each individual part that you receive from the vendor. And that is going to be covered in, in the next session. Mm -hmm. And that is on March 6, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Let's go to the next component, a complete cycle of the tre simulated treatment. So what I do, and this is a, you can't read the details of this picture, but I, I create a little workflow that writes down for everybody what each step is and in which order that, that happens. And so we then perform an end-to-end -end test. We yeah. use a simple phantom and every single step should be, oops, yeah. Every single step of the workflow should be performed by the staff who's actually going to do it in your clinic. Yeah. And the goal of doing that is you, you also will see if the staff understands what they're supposed to do and if they know what information they need to hand off to the next person. Now the presentation disappeared from my slide. Do you see me? Ah, now I see it again. Okay. So run through it with everybody on board, make sure everybody understands what they're doing. Check that the afterloader does what it's doing and that everything is clear. And this is your opportunity without a patient of the table to talk through everything and resolve all remaining questions. When you start out with your new applicator, I always recommend start with easy patients, the cylinders. Don't jump in with a prostate HDR cylinder, then you do a tandem and ring, then maybe tandem and ring with one or two needles, go to interstitial and work your way toward more complex cases. Next slide. Let me pause and just pass an announcement because I'm also struggling to mute people even though I'm the host. So just a courtesy reminder, everyone, we're getting a lot of feedback from people whose computers are not muted, like the Zooms are not muted. So if you you're not muted can you please do as the curtsy and mute so that you know you don't distract your fellow participants i um, would really appreciate that thank you so next slide please so oh, that, oh, sorry okay. <laughs> that one yeah. so you'll you'll choose a commission transfer tube and applicator and we'll talk about that next well, session well. you'll have the technologist yes, image the well, applicator well, Please mute yourself, have the technologist image the applicator, have the physicist or whoever creates the treatment plan, create the plan and have the technician deliver the treatment. Uh, if you have it available on your site, check the dose using the TLDO film. Please mute yourself. Okay, next slide. So other commissioning tasks about the transfer tubes, applicators and treatment planning system. Okay, next slide. So let's go to ongoing equipment QA. Some of the tests that you're doing for, that you're doing during the commissioning will need to be repeated on a regular basis as part of ongoing QA. So you will have daily that you will do on the day of treatment before you do any treatment and you will have treat QA that you do after source QA 
exchange. Iridium-192 is exchanged quarterly, cobalt-60 more rarely. And then you sometimes also have annual QA tests. Next slide, please. So daily QA, you do that before the morning of the treatment. The screenshot on the right-hand side is from the Excel spreadsheet that you, you will receive. You check that the date and time is correct in the system. My, my old system had a problem with daylight savings time, so I had to actually manually do that. You check the source strength and that the decay is handled correctly in your system versus an Excel spreadsheet that you have. You check the source position, the timer accuracy, the safety interlocks of door transfer to an applicator. You check that the intercom and your video and audio still work in both directions, that the radiation warning lights are functional and the interrupt emergency stop is functional and your emergency equipment is present and in good working order. That's usually about a half hour that you need to spend each morning to, to go through all that. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Okay. Again, you will have Excel spreadsheets that have all these tests listed and nice tools in there. So checks to be done after your source exchange or quarterly if you check your source, if you exchange your source less than each three months. You check that your well chamber is still uh, consistently working. You can do that with a Linux or with a check source. You do, you do a source strength measurement which you also need to do after any repairs that require removal of the source from the afterloader. You do source position check with film again. You, you do that with also after the source is moved in and out of the applicator. And I see this, this, the slides are not coming through very clear. I have the same issue here. You will get a copy of the presentation. So you check the length of the transfer tube. There is usually you will receive a, a ruler and some kind of system with a ruler that you can use to check your transfer tube length. You do your daily QA tests, you repeat them and you check that the daily QA tests have been done. And when you get a new source, you need to put the new source information in your treatment unit and your planning system. And you do need to generate a new decay table. You'll have that in your Excel spreadsheet and print that out and have that at the treatment console and the planning area. So you can actually check that the decay of today is in agreement with <clears throat> what your treatment planning system says versus your Excel spreadsheet. I recently in my clinic actually had an issue where the physicists entered the new source in the treatment planning system, but he did not put all significant digits in. And over time, after two months, that actually led to a discrepancy of 1% between the actual source strength and what the treatment planning system had. And we found that because we had this Excel spreadsheet that showed us what the source strength should have been in the planning system, and we noticed this discrepancy. So. Next slide, please. Annual QA. I go through all my applicators that I have and check visually. Are they in good working order? Are there any cracks, breaks, anything that looks funky? I do a sample recommissioning. Are the sources still going to the correct place? I verify that the valve chamber calibration is up to date. In the United States, we send them to the calibration lab every other year. So if a recalibration is coming up, I notice that. Same thing for the electrometer. If it needs recalibration pretty soon, I make sure that happens. I review all of the documentation, checklists, forms, because our clinical practice does change. We figure out better way to do things, different way to do things. We get new software and sometimes our documentation and checklists get out of sync with clinical practice. So the annual QA is a good opportunity to check that everything is up to date. I also do often with, usually with the service engineer, take the whole team together and do an emergency procedure training. And that includes a dry run. We actually simulate an emergency. We have each person in the team perform their role. 
And we have one person with a stopwatch and a timer sitting there and actually telling us how long we took to go through each of these steps. I saw a question pop up on electrometer calibration in the United States. We do this every two years. There may be different local regulations for you, so you need to check that as well, as well, but at least every two years. So emergency procedure, actually do it. Run into the room, pretend you're throwing something in, in the emergency pig, communicate, figure out who needs to go where to minimize the radiation exposure. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So how do the daily tests differ from the source exchange and annual QA tests? A, they're mostly functional tests and only needed to be done on treatment days. B, they're mostly functional tests and are needed to be done on treatment days as well as during source exchange and annual QA. C, they require the use of the well chamber and D, they need to do, be done multiple times per day. I'll give you like 15 to 20 seconds to think about it and then Afua can pull up the next slide with the answer. Ah, oh, I see Benjamin Lee joined. Hi, Benjamin, good morning. Okay, I think this should be one of our last slides and then we can dive into the questions mm -hmm. that you all put in the chat. Mm -hmm. Let's bring up the next slide. So we're having problems with our poll, so thanks for, you know, doing this with us. Yeah. So daily QA tests, they're mostly functional tests and they need to be done on each treatment day as well as when you do a source exchange or your annual QA. And let's see, is this the last slide? Yeah, one of the last but one. Okay. Yeah, it's... Uh, so, okay, <laughs> errors. Why do we do all of these tests? Mistakes happen, things break, we are human. There is actually a free publication from the ICRU, publication 97, Prevention of HDR Brachytherapy Accidents. They have examples of HDR units damaged in transit, source cable that's separated from the drive unit, so the source couldn't be pulled back into the afterloader, errors of a new source strength not added to afterloader at source exchange. A source detached from the cable and remained in the catheter and inside the patient for four days. That actually unfortunately killed the patient. And there's also been incidents of inadequate bunker shielding, which is a safety issue for staff. Next slide, please. Ah, that was, yeah, some resources. There is the um, code of practice for brachytherapy physics. That's very helpful to have. It has all these recommendations in it. And it's actually WAPM is currently working on an update. There's also a publication on failure modes and effects for GYN brachy and a publication on a mechanical evaluation of the new Bravos applicator system because that is not included in the society recommendations yet. It's a new device. And with that, I thank you everybody for the attention. Thank you.